This is 24. We're going to read from verse 10. And this is Abraham sending his servant uh, back to uh, Mesopotamia, where he came from, to uh, his relatives to find a bride for Isaac. So verse 10, Matthew 24. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed, for all the goods of his master were in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, unto the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, Let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink. And she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. And it came to pass, before he had done speaking, that, behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher upon her shoulder. And the damsel was very fair to look upon, a virgin, neither had any men known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord, and she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand, and gave him drink. And when she had done drink, giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also, until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough, and ran again unto the well to draw water, and drew for all his camels. And the man, wondering at her, held his peace, to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the camels had done drinking, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel weight and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold, and said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee, is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said to him, I am the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said, Moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough and room to lodge in. And the man bowed down his head and worshipped the Lord. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of my master Abraham, who hath not left destitute my master of his mercy and his truth. I being in the way, the Lord led me to the house of my master's brethren. And the damsel ran and told them of her mother's house these things. And Rebekah had a brother, and his name was Laban. And Laban ran out unto the man unto the well. And it came to pass, when he saw the earring and bracelets upon his sister's hands, and when he heard the words of Rebekah his sister, saying, Thus spake the man unto me, that he came unto the man, and behold, he stood by the camels at the well. And he said, Come in, thou blessed of the Lord, wherefore standest thou without? For I have prepared the house and room for the camels. And the man came into the house, and he ungirded his camels, and gave straw and provender for the camels, and water to wash his feet and the men's feet that were with him. And there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told mine errand. And he said, Speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he's become great. And he's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah, my master's wife, bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, They shall not take a wife to, the, to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but they shall go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. And I said unto my master, Put adventure the woman will not follow me. And he said unto me, The Lord before whom I walk will send his angel with thee and prosper thy way, and thou shalt take a wife for my son of my kindred and of my father's house. Then shalt thou be clear from this my oath, when thou comest to my kindred, and if they give not thee one, thou shalt be clear from my oath. And I came this day unto the well, and said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, if now thou do prosper my way which I go, behold, I stand by the well of water, and it shall come to pass that when the virgin cometh forth to draw water, and I say to her, Give me, I pray thee, a little water of thy pitcher to drink, and she say to me, Both drink thou, and I'll also draw for thy camels. Let the same be the woman.
whom the Lord hath appointed out for my master's son. And before I had done speaking in mine heart, behold, Rebekah came forth with her pitcher on her shoulder. And she went down unto the well and drew water and said unto her, And I said unto her, Let me drink, I pray thee. And she made haste and let down her pitcher from her shoulder and said, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. So I drank, and she made the camels drink also. And I asked her, and said, Whose daughter art thou? And she said, The daughter of Bethuel, Nahor's son, whom Milcah bare unto him. And I put the earring upon her face, and the bracelets upon her hands. And I bowed down my head, and worshipped the Lord, and blessed the Lord God of my master Abraham, which had led me in the right way to take my master's brother's daughter unto his son. And now, if ye will deal kindly and truly with my master, tell me, and if not, tell me, that I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Then Laban and Bethuel answered and said, The thing proceeded from the Lord, we cannot speak unto thee bad or good. Behold, Rebekah is before thee, take her and go, and let her be thy master's son's wife, as the Lord hath spoken. It came to pass that when Abraham's servant heard their words, he worshipped the Lord, bearing himself to the earth. And the servant brought forth jewels of silver, and jewels of gold and raiment, and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. And they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tallied all night. And they rose up in the morning, and he said, Send me away unto my master. And a brother and a mother said, Let the damsel abide with us a few days, at the least ten. After that she shall go. And he said unto them, Hinder me not, seeing the Lord hath prospered my way. Send me away, that I may go to my master. And they said, We will call the damsel and inquire at her mouth. And they called Rebekah and said unto her, Wilt thou go with this man? And she said, I will go. And they sent away Rebekah their sister and her nurse and Abraham's servant and his men. And they blessed Rebekah and said unto her, Thou art our sister, be thou the mother of thousands of millions, and let thy seed possess the gate of those which hate them. And Rebekah arose unto damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And Isaac came from the way of the well Lahoiroi, Lahoiroi, for he dwelt in the south country. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes, and when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent, and took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. What we have, of course, in this chapter is the Gospel Illustrated. And um, I remember seeing it, really, reading it through for myself as a young believer, probably within a year of getting saved, reading through this, and suddenly seeing Jesus, and suddenly realising that the Gospel was hidden here. And then later on I picked up a commentary and I found the man was saying exactly what I'd seen in the Bible and I picked up another one and he was saying the same thing. Now of course the commentators do copy one another whether they be reformed or otherwise. Uh, but I felt quite sure that this, this line that I'm going to take this morning uh, is in keeping with the teaching of the scriptures as a whole. Uh, the gospel is illustrated I say. First of all when we think of Abraham we want to think of the father. When we think of Isaac, what you think of the son? Because Isaac was born miraculously. He, he called the first Abraham's firstborn son, although strictly he wasn't. Or Ishmael was, of course. But he's called the firstborn son. He was born miraculously, and the land was promised him. And in every sense, he's a real picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in the servant, we have the Holy Ghost, a picture of the Holy Ghost. And in Rebecca, a picture of the church. And what this chapter is all about is a picture of the ministry of the Holy Ghost calling out the church the church is in the greek the greek word you probably heard it is ecclesia you sometimes get it anglicized we talk about ecclesiastics and ecclesiastical and so on it comes from the greek word ecclesia which means called out and just as rebecca was called out of mesopotamia so the church is called out to be the bride of christ and rebecca is the picture of the church so abraham the father isaac the son rebecca the church and the servant the holy spirit he's the one that's been sent by the father to glorify the son to bring a bride back for the lord jesus christ now i'm a dispensational preacher as some of you most of you are aware uh, for whatever whatever you might think about that is neither here nor there 
uh, but these chapters, these few chapters here, lay out a dispensational picture. If you turn to, don't do it, but if you were turned to read chapter 21, you'd find there the story of the birth of Isaac, the miraculous birth of Isaac, which speaks, of course, of the birth of Christ. And then in chapter 22, you have Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah, which now speaks of the death of the offering, the sacrifice of Christ. So his birth in 21, his sacrifice in 22. But in chapter 23, Sarah dies, Abraham's wife dies, and she's a picture of Israel. Because Israel, I'm talking about the nation of Israel, the offspring of Jacob and his four wives, those 12 sons became a nation, and you find as you read through the Old Testament that God speaks of himself as her husband, and she is his wife. So Israel is the wife of Jehovah, but the church is the bride of Christ, as I understand scripture. And Sarah dies in chapter 23, after the sacrifice of Christ, in chapter 22, or the sacrifice of Isaac. And then in chapter 24 here, we now find Rebecca is being sought. And then when you open up chapter 25, we read, Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And this is Israel reborn this is the the return uh the rebirth if you will of the nation of israel after the church is called out and she meets with the lord jesus typified by isaac at the end of chapter 4 chapter 24 so the servant uh, pictures here the holy ghost presenting the gospel and i'm sure i've only i've hardly seen a thing i know there's a, a far more here than i've seen i know that and i get frustrated sometimes because i, I think there's there's something here lord you're not telling me there's far more here than i'm going to be able to give you this morning uh, i regret to say but hopefully there'll be something of a blessing anyway so just selecting a few verses to to illustrate the gospel and the work of the Holy Spirit and his work is our work okay we are the bride but we're also the servant in a sense because what he does he does through the church so what we see the servant doing is a picture not only um, of Rebecca but the, the servant himself is a picture of what we should be doing to bring others into the body of Christ so we should be going out like the servant did to bring others to the Lord let's look at verse uh, verse 8 first of all I'll just notice something there with you um, if the woman Abraham says to we didn't read this in our reading but Abraham says to the servant if the woman will not be willing to follow thee then thou shalt be clear from this my oath only bring not my son thither again and look at chapter uh, verse 58 of our chapter verse 58 and they called Rebekah and said unto her wilt thou go with this man and she said I will go she had a choice she was not um, for, or, or what shall I say, she was not predestinated to be Isaiah's wife, Isaac's wife. She had the choice of being um, Isaac's wife. And so this here is consistent with the gospel that man has a free will. He can, expect, he can accept or he can reject the call of Christ in the gospel. Rebecca had a choice. Abraham speaks of that choice if the woman will not be willing and we find that she is asked and the Lord has no doubt as he always does has worded the scriptures perfectly the older I get the more I read the more I am astounded at the perfection of the scriptures and the Lord chooses his words very carefully and we're told she had a choice for a reason you have a choice you could go to heaven if you want to you can be made right with Christ if you want to, or you can refuse and go to hell if you prefer that. And hell, of course, in our modern society, is being told, is being pictured as a place of partying and fun. Those stupid people have got another thing coming. It will be no fun in that place. You have a choice this morning. Now, um, it's, it's the Lord who initiates. The Lord, Jesus said, you have no, cho not chosen me, but I have chosen you. The Lord initiates the whole thing. It's Abraham's decision. The servant comes. Rebecca knows nothing about this. The Lord is reaching out to her to begin with, but she still has a choice. So I believe that God works sovereignly in salvation, yes. I believe that he, he reaches out to us, but I believe we still have a choice. Verse 11 and he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water 
at the time of the evening, even the time that women go out to draw water, you will perhaps be aware that Moses also found his wife at a well. Uh, she was the daughter of Ruel, he's also called Jethro, who was a priest of Midian. And uh, when Moses fled from Egypt, uh, she comes out, as the women do, to the well, and Moses stands up against the shepherds to defend her, and he met his wife at the well too. Jacob, you remember, meets Jacob at the at, uh, Rebecca. Who did he meet at the well? Let me think. He met Rachel at the well, that's right. And then, of course, just to confirm that there is a gospel picture here, we see the Lord Jesus in John's Gospel, chapter 4, meeting the woman of Samaria at a well. She was a Gentile. When the Assyrians took captives, when they took a city, they would swap the populations over because they believed very much in, in the gods of the land and they believed very much that people could fight better on their own territory than they could elsewhere. So as a safeguard, the Assyrians would take the uh, people of Samaria away. In the New Testament, of course, those are called Samaritans. They would take those away and they would bring strangers from other places into the land, which is why the Jews looked upon Samaritans as half-breeds. They were not properly Jews. They were Gentiles. So we have the Lord Jesus meeting with a Gentile woman at the well. Moses meets with a Gentile woman at the well. The children of Israel are all back in Egypt still. And this is a picture I would suggest to you of the Lord meeting his church. The well speaks to me of fundamental human need. You know, you can live without food for a while, but you don't live without water for very long. Um... The main, the main sort of uh, health setups in the NHS and so on won't tell you very often these days how important water is to you. And so many of our illnesses are because we lack water. So many sicknesses that we suffer from in the West are caused by dehydration. Water is a fundamental need. And uh, so the well speaks of uh, not, not just of what the water that we drink, but it speaks of fundamental human needs. And it's true, isn't it, that man's extremity is God's opportunity. It's most often that men find God, as did I, in the depths of calamity and helplessness. There came a time in my life when I was 24, having done my own thing for, for you know, until I was 24, when I remembered the house I lived in in Shelbyley Wood, standing in the kitchen one night and helplessly saying to, I knew not who, God, I must be good for something. Make me thy servant make me your servant because I wouldn't have known the AV then and uh, that's exactly what the Lord did but so often we have to brought to be brought calamities before we will call upon the Lord and if you're not the Lord's this morning and you're resisting the gospel this morning look out because he wants you saved and if he has to he'll put your face in the dust and he'll make you He'll break you until eventually you say, God help me. This is I can't quite remember the line there, but there's a line about there, no, there, be, there were no atheists in the trenches or something like this, you know. And uh, man's extremity is God. God doesn't want to put, he doesn't want to put you through trials and hardships, but we're so stubborn. And sometimes, he, and he, he broke me, I tell you, he broke me, and some, one or two others of you could probably say the same thing. We will do anything we can and we will go anywhere we can for any support other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the well speaks to me of this place of deep human need. Prisons and hospitals, I would suggest, are good places for evangelism um, because people are often in desperate situations in those places. But there are unseen wells too. I'm hoping the Lord willing to go up to town this morning and I'll be praying that there'll be people there who are at the well, people who are at the, at the in the pits they're in deep need and they know they're in deep need those people are more likely to listen than anybody else verse 12 and he said O Lord God of my master Abraham I pray thee send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham he loves Abraham it's quite evident um, we're not told who his name was uh, the Holy Spirit is never given a name in the Bible father has many names he's called all sorts of names in the bible uh, especially in the hebrew bible names like jehovah jireh jehovah shalom and so on we have jehovah here we have Hadonai, we have elohim all sorts of names for god the lord jesus a number of names emmanuel he's called christ he's called jesus he's called the lord jesus christ 
But the Holy Spirit is always the Holy Spirit or the, the Spirit or the Holy Ghost, never a name. And so this man, this servant isn't named. Um, but it's clear that he loves Abraham. And uh, Abraham was such a man of God that he had a powerful eff effect, not only on his children, but upon his servants. And it's clear that this man feels a great privilege and a great joy to be involved in serving Abraham. And so he prays, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee, send me good speed this day and show kindness unto my master Abraham. It's a good thing to pray uh, on the merits of another man. If the servant asks a blessing for Abraham's sake, and he does, he asks in Abraham's name, and he asks for Abraham's sake, we can certainly ask for Jesus' sake. And uh, we, you know, when we say, though, um, when we finish our prayers with for Jesus' sake, that's exactly what we should mean. The whole pre presentation of the gospel, it's all for his praise and his glory. There's no one else that deserves any praise, any glory. And if we will learn to pray for Jesus' sake, we might see more answers to our prayers. And if we learn to pray in Jesus' name, I'm always reminding God of the cross. Especially when I'm desperate, I remind God of the cross. I remind God. Not that he needs reminding, really. It's in reminding him that I remind myself. God's eyes always on the cross. God's eyes always on the Son. But nevertheless, when I when I pray, when I'm desperate, I remind in fact when I'm not desperate, I remind God of the cross. Because it's for Christ's sake that God will bless and God will save. For Christ's sake, he will do that. Because he's worthy. Verse 21. And the man wondering at her, this is after she's fed the camel, she's given the camel's drink. And the man wondering at her held his peace to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And I have a note in my margin, so does the Holy Ghost wait upon a man or a woman. Just as it is her choice, so the man is wondering. And the Holy Ghost waits to see. Are you one? Are you one whom the Lord has called? Calvinism, Schmalvinism is what I say, as far as this is concerned, that's what I've written in my Bible. Calvinism, Schmalvinism. God doesn't insist, uh, God doesn't make anybody come to Christ. He's a gentleman, he invites, he draws, he, he does everything he can to draw, but he won't insist. He won't force you to become a Christian. And the man wondering at her held his peace to it whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. So he's watched her. He asked, first of all, that not only would she give him a drink, but she would say, I will, I will water the camels also. And that's exactly what she did. And that said, Sim wondering, is this, is this the woman? It was her character that commanded her, that commended her, not her looks. Um... I remember Herbert Rouse saying many years ago, uh, most farmers wouldn't buy a hog by midnight. Uh, any any self-respecting farmer wouldn't buy a hog by midnight. By, by, by what's the word he used? Any self-respecting farmer would not buy a hog at night time. But that's the way most of us get our wives. And um, it's the looks these days and women are all far more concerned about their looks than they are about their character and men are the same far more concerned about what we look like than whether we're obedient people whether we're faithful people whether we're people with integrity this uh, the holy spirit pictured here is is looking at her, what she has done and her, her behavior and her speech and the kindness and that's what's making him ask the question John Trapp said many women are like an Egyptian temple varnish without and vermin within typical John Trapp he also said nothing has so enriched hell as beautiful faces how true that is nothing has so enriched hell as beautiful faces so her character is what commended her maybe some of you young fellows will be looking for a wife um, in years to come don't just go on looks. Don't just go on looks. You know, I've been teaching people to drive now for 20 years, and the majority of those have been young women, mostly Muslim women. 
And just once or twice I've had a very beautiful young woman that I've been teaching until she opens a mouth. And I think to myself, you've just ruined everything. You might look nice, but you've got a mouth like a 40 year Navy man. And he puts you, you know, well, I, it put, I won't say it puts me off, that's not quite right, I'm a happily married man, but you know what I mean. It exposes their, what comes out of their mouth exposes their character. And, uh, you know, when you get older and you're looking for a wife, don't just go for some good looking woman. Find out about her character. And the Lord is looking for people, of course, the Holy Ghost is looking for people that will love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the critical thing. Verse 33, the uh, servant comes into the house now and there was set meat before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I have told my errand. And he said, speak on. The flesh must always be subject to the spirit. Thinking of us now as the servant, thinking of us now as, as being uh, used of the Holy Spirit to win souls. He says, I will not eat until I have told my errand. The spirit takes priority over the flesh. You know, most of you know that we are three parts. We're, we're tripartite, body, soul, and spirit. And if you ask your average believer, maybe most of you here, and I've just done it the wrong way around, to name the three parts, we'll tend to begin with the body. The Bible doesn't do that. When the Bible talks about our nature, it says spirit, soul, and body, because the spirit is first. <laughs> 1 Thessalonians 5.23 talks about God sanctifying us wholly, spirit, soul and body. That's the order. Again, the problem with our society is body's, body's everything, body's first. And then the soul is next, the inward man, what he likes and the spirit doesn't come into it whatsoever. So he won't, he won't, tell his, uh, he won't eat until he's told his message, until he's done his work for the Lord. And I fear that I fail personally, I fail often. Uh, on this front Eve fell in the same place you remember she saw that the tree was good for food and it was a cause of a downfall the man of God from Judah that alarming passage 1 Kings chapter 13 who was sent a powerful man of God I've found out recently I think his name was Shemaiah because a couple of previous chapters we read of a man of God it's a rare title in the Bible so almost certainly I think this was Shemaiah and he was a man of God and he went and rebuked the altar in, in Bethel but it was his, his appetite that was his downfall and it was over his appetite that he was tricked and uh, you read some of these 16th century guys I tell you they're so challenging um, and I think it was John Trapp it might have been Joseph Hall that said no minister should be a slave to his palate man that's, that's fearful stuff for somebody on the platform no minister but it's true of us all if we're serving the Lord we shouldn't be a slave to our palate those things should come second I will not eat until I have told my errand. You remember the Lord Jesus was tempted here, also the first temptation. Turn these stones into bread. But the devil, of course, was on a hiding to nothing with that one. He was talking to the Son of God. And so he failed. We find the same thing in the parallel account in John's Gospel. You remember chapter 4, where the Lord Jesus meets the woman of Samaria. What do we find? The disciples have gone off into the city to buy meat. <laughs> Their priority is food. His priority is his father's business. And when they come back, he says to them, I have meat to eat that you know not of, to, to do the father's work, John chapter 4. So the same picture there. We are the Lord's servants. We are not our own. We are bought with a price. And his business ought to be our first priority. Look at verse 54. This is after that they have agreed to send Rebecca back, verse 54, and they did eat and drink, he and the men that were with him, and tallied all night, and they rose up in the morning, and he said, send me away unto my master. So, you know, there's nothing wrong with eating and drinking, but there's a time for everything. Comforts are not forbidden the Christian, but they must be in their place. As, as, as uh, Solomon reminds us in the book of Exodus, there's a time to every purpose under the heaven. Verse 34, and he said, I am Abraham's servant. After he's told them he must tell his errand, he begins with, I am Abraham's servant. He was clearly proud to be so. And we ought not to be ashamed to call ourselves the servants of the Lord. We ought not to be ashamed 
to call ourselves Christians, if we are Christians. Paul says in Romans 1, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. The power of God unto righteousness to everyone that believes. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. And what really he's saying there, in a sense he's saying the opposite. He's saying I'm, I'm, I'm proud of this message. That's what he's saying. It's a wonderful message and I'm so glad to be a preacher, Paul is telling us. Verse 35, we'll just read a few verses here if we may. And the Lord hath blessed my master greatly, and he's become great, and he hath given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants and maid servants and camels and asses. And Sarah my master's wife bare a son to my master when she was old, and unto him hath he given all that he hath. And my master made me swear, saying, Thou shalt not take a wife to my son of the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell. But they shall go unto my father's house and to my kindred and take a wife unto my son. So it's a personal relationship here. The servant is making clear that he has come to find a bride. It's a person. He hasn't come looking for another servant. Again, Herbie Roush used to say, um, the Lord's got 10,000 angels to do his work. He's looking for somebody to love him. <laughs> How true that is. So much ministry these days emphasizes all the time what you should be doing and what this servant is doing is speaking about his master and he's speaking about the son and my ministry will be better when I get more in the swing of preaching Christ and not just telling you what to do so you go to all sorts of churches and be told what to do and how to live all the cultists will tell you what to do and how to live the Muslims will tell you what to do and how to live get a lot of it wrong but some of it they get right but the servant came to win a bride God's got 10,000 angels and more to do his work he's looking for someone to love him and this perhaps at this point was the first Rebecca had heard of it because he hadn't said at the well what his purpose was but now this is probably the first she's heard of it and men have no idea like Rebecca how great the gospel is even we as believers don't clearly see the height of our calling we are called to uh, an, uh, an unimaginable heights and glory we're going to be the bride we are the bride of Christ and one day that's going to be fulfilled and we're going to be with the Lord in glory and it's hard really to get your head round the height of our calling it's magnificent to be made perfect these bodies are going to be changed we read and made like unto his glorious body all our sins forgiven they're forgiven already some people are not sure they say they're Christians they go to church they read the Bible they're not sure whether they're going to make it if you're not sure whether you're going to make it you're probably not going to make it Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures the Lord Jesus has done it all that's where we rest that's where the peace comes that's where the joy comes that's where the praise comes was it this last Wednesday, I can't remember, I talked about the smitten rock. You remember how the rock was smitten um, and the water gushed out? And then later on, Moses is told to speak to the rock and he doesn't, he smites it. And it's a picture of how um, that for, for some men that one sm smiting of Christ isn't enough. He was smitten once, he died once. We don't, he's not going to be smitten again. That's what the Catholics do every mass they smite him again they sacrifice him again which is tantamount to saying the cross isn't good enough the cross didn't finish it the cross finished it my friend the cross finished it there you must rest it's not your works it will never be your works and it will never be mine you must rest at the foot of the cross and what a rest it is what a rest it is what a victory it is what a joy it is and what happened when the rock was smitten the water flowed out and you don't get the water, the Holy Ghost, until you understand that Christ was smitten and that he was smitten for you. And when you take that personally, you get the water. And it's the water of eternal life. And God doesn't take, it, the promises of God are without repentance, the Bible says. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't take them back. If I sin, and I do, regrettably, and I think things sometimes, and I, I'm ashamed of them, <coughs> regrettably, I'm still saved. It might have consequences in my life, perhaps. 
but I'm still saved because he has paid the price. The Bible is clear. The New Testament is clear. This is why I think dispensational distinctions are important because if you get all your doctrine out of the Gospels, it's going to mess your brains up. Because when you come to Paul, you won't be able to square the two. There's, all, there's so much in the Gospels about what you need to do. But Paul makes it clear. And they didn't understand in the Gospels when the Lord was teaching them. They were not looking for the cross. They were not preaching the cross. The preachers these days don't know whether they're coming in or going out. They don't know the first thing. Seems to me often about what the Gospels teach. They were not preaching the cross. They were preaching the kingdom. They were preaching the king is here. The Messiah is here. The kingdom is about to be set up. That was their message. So that when he said to them, I'm going to be crucified, they didn't know what he was talking about. They couldn't believe it. And even after he rose, they couldn't believe it. It was not what they were preaching. And if we don't make a distinction between the truths of the Gospels, and it's, it's not easy to do, as I appreciate, it's not easy to do, but the way to get the Gospels in, in a proper understanding is to make sure you understand the epistles of Paul, the Pauline letters, that Christ died for us and then finished this. But I've gone on a bit long on that point. We'll move on. Verse 53 And the servant brought forth jewels of silver <coughs> and jewels of gold and raiments and gave them to Rebekah. He gave also to her brother and to her mother precious things. So having now got the permission of her father, which we used to do in this country, which girls used to do, the father had a say in who they married. Still, we're sunk, aren't we, really, on so much of this. But having got the agreement of her father, we find uh, the servant brought forth jewels of silver, jewels of gold and raiment. Jewels of silver, this is now the Holy Spirit teaching us the glories of Christ. Jewels of silver speaks of redemption truths. The silver in the Bible speaks of the blood of Christ. And what precious things those are to a believer. Far more valuable to us than silver or gold. You know, when I come to town, if I do get up to town today, I'm taking some gospel tracts. And uh, they're not too bad in Dudley. Eight out of ten people will take them. I'll tell you what, if these were five pound notes, I'd be trampled underfoot, wouldn't I? But actually, they're more, they're more valuable, really, than five pound notes are. But the people of this world haven't got a clue what's valuable. They don't know what's worthless, and they don't know what's precious. They haven't got a clue. The word of God is precious. The gospel is precious. Redemption truths are precious. Jewels of silver. Jewels of gold she received. These are revelations of divine glory. And this is what one of the joys of the Christian life is having the Holy Ghost bringing these truths, truths to us. Putting these jewels upon us, if you will. Revelations of divine glory. The gold speaks of the glory of God. The deity of Christ. The preciousness of scripture. And those who see and understand how precious the scriptures are don't take lightly having it messed around with. We don't like to see the Bible treated lightly. And if you've read it and you've read it much and you've found the, the beauties of it and the glories of it and you found Christ there, you're not going to suffer fools to mess around with your book. And then she had raiment, it says. The servant brought forth raiment. This speaks of a new character. Clothes are called, the old fashioned folks used to refer to clothes as a habit. Monks wear habits, it's what you dress in. And the, the word habit it has to do with character. And clothes are character in the Bible. She received, if you will, as we do, a new character. If any man be in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5 10, 17, he's a new creature. Behold, all things are passed away, all things have become new. We receive a new character. We're given raiment, we're clothed in Christ. Verse 61. And Rebekah arose and the damsels, and they rode upon the camels and followed the man. And the servant took Rebekah and went his way. And that's where we believers on this, are this morning. We're on that camel ride. We're going out to meet the Lord. We're on that camel ride. We've come out of Mesopotamia, or we should have done. We've come out of the world, and we're going to meet the Lord. We're on that camel ride. Now, I suppose that as they went, as they went, Rebecca might have said to him, Tell me about Isaac. Tell, tell me more about Isaac. Tell me more, oh, tell me more. 
of him I love. Tell me more. Who, who having not seen, says the Bible, you love? Tell me more about your master's son. And as they travelled, no doubt that servant would have said, well, I'll tell you, Isaac did this and Isaac said this. And he would have just magnified Isaac in her sight. And the further we travel on that journey, the longer we're going on that journey, the more we should be developing an appreciation of who it is we're going to meet. The more we should be wanting to know more about Jesus. Tell me more, we sing, don't we, of Christ my Saviour. Tell me more of him I love. And we read that the servant took Rebecca in verse 61. And the servant took Rebecca. He leads and we follow. The Holy Ghost leads and we follow. He took her. She didn't take him. Too many Christians want God to do what they want to do. Too often they want God to bless their plans. Instead of saying, Lord, what wouldst thou have me to do? Where will you have me to go? What's your will, Lord? What pleases you? The servant took her. The Holy Spirit must always lead. Verse 63. And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. Now I see the rapture here. Don't know whether you all believe in the rapture. Perhaps some of you don't. I don't know. But she goes to meet him, and he comes to meet her. And I think there's a little picture, a lovely little picture of the rapture here. And something even more precious in verse uh, 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah and she became his wife and he loved her and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. The church is God's comfort to Christ after the death of the nation of Israel. I am sure the Lord Jesus was saddened he wept over Jerusalem. And after the death of Sarah, Israel, the bride is called. And after the rejection of the kingdom by Israel, the bride is called. And it's a comfort to the son. And there is a day coming, Genesis chapter 25, when Abraham marries again. And there's a day coming when Israel will be restored. I don't go along with the theology that makes Israel and the church the same. You can't read the Old Testament prophets and make them the same. It's bunkum. They are two different bodies. But thank God, the important thing is, we're bound for glory. If we're believers this morning, have you seen any of the jewels of silver this week? Have you seen any of the jewels of gold this week? Have you been reminded this week that you're a new creature? And the Lord is coming. She went out to meet him, but he came out to meet her. We're going to see him one day, we're going to hear him one day, we're going to meet him in the air. I'm quite sure about that. So, Lord willing, might be a blessing for us here this morning. Might be something you can take away. I pray so. Amen. Amen.